Thank you for joining us. Tonight we're going to talk about the very troubled relationship uh, between the labor movement and the Tory government. Uh, as you will recall, the Barbary government introduced Bill 40, the so-called scab labor law. Mike Harris barely had his feet under the table when he repealed that law and replaced it with Bill 7. Uh, these changes uh, have caused a great furor in the labor movement. Uh, they've held one demonstration in London, Ontario, a second one planned for Hamilton, February 23rd, 4th, I believe it is, and uh, they plan to have many more and have threatened to shut down the entire province unless uh, some changes are made. Two of our panelists tonight are associated with the labor movement. David St. John uh, is the chairman of the Victoria County Coalition for Social Justice, and Rick Denyer is the president of the Lindsay District Labor Council. And we have uh, two other panelists that are very active in the, in the political arena, but they're not associated with the current uh, uh, provincial government. Uh, Bob Metz is the president of the Freedom Party of Ontario, and Don Pinnell is the leader of the Family Coalition Party. Perhaps, Dave, we can start with you. Will you tell us what there is, uh, what has been changed in labor legislation that has so enraged uh, the labor movement? Well, uh, first of all, let me say that uh, labor was under no illusions uh, during the provincial campaign. Mike Harrison and the Tories made it clear that the repeal uh, Bill 40, which is scab legislation, there were no uh, benefits to the legislation, to the labor movement people in general. Uh, one, of course, was the anti-scab provision. Uh, one, one other provision made it easier for agriculture and domestics to organize. Uh, uh, the problem that we have had with the uh, Tories' bill is that Bill 7 doesn't just take us back to Bill 40. Bill 7 and it'll take us, takes us back to the 1940s. And a lot of the provisions for secret ballot votes and, and, and uh, making it much more difficult to organize service sector, contract, and part-time workers, for instance, um, have, have the, the outrage that, that has been witnessed in the streets of London and will be witnessed in the streets of Hamilton. Well, maybe we should tackle these things one at a time then. What about the scab labor law? Uh, what do you think, uh, Bob? Uh, is that a retrogressive step well, on the part of the Tory government? I, I don't even like the word scab labor. Mm -hmm. I think it's indicative of an attitude behind the labor movement, which is very labor. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to be clear that the labor movement is a labor monopoly mm -hmm. representing a very narrow gap or n narrow interest of labor at the exclusion of others. And the other people we're talking about are the unemployed, people who would be willing to compete with organized labor but are not given that permission to do so because of laws that prevent them from entering the labor force. Um, and it's not surprising that people who are within the labor movement are being caught between a rock and a hard place, price themselves out of the marketplace. The consumer is not willing to pay the prices necessary to support unionized labor when there's alternative labor available at, at cheaper prices, and this is only natural. So I think what we're seeing right now is, is evidence of a dying movement that's in its last breath. We're moving to a global economy. We're talking about competition in labor as well as in, and that's the way it should be. Evidence of a dying movement. <coughs> what do you say to well, that? <laughs> I'd like to know why everybody, if we're dying, why is everybody working so hard to get rid of us? Mm. It's the labor movement. Just quickly, I'd like to say, I'd like to ask, how many doctors would we have in this town today? How many dentists would we have in this town today? How many eye optical st shops would we have in this town today? And how many pharmacists would we have in this town today without these union bargaining contracts that bring all this extra money into the community, provide for the doctors and the dentists, and, or just what revert back to where people stayed sick, didn't get the medicine, and also walked around with holes in their teeth. We are a more healthier society today because of it, and I think you're wrong by saying we're a dying movement, we're getting stronger. Do you think, though, that we we're healthier because we have unions? Is that what uh, I heard you say? Yes, you did. Um, the union started the health plan out west years ago, and because of this health plan, everybody has got onto it, the OHIP come onto it, and it has um, made us more acceptable, doctors more acceptable to all of us. I think, I think th there's a point too, and, and, and Rick's making a point when he says that what unions do is, is often lay the groundwork. I, I, I like to use the example of Stelco and DeFasco. 
in, in Hamilton. Every time Stelco goes out and bargains a contract with the uh, Steelworkers, United Steelworkers of America, goes out and bargains a contract for the workers at, Stil at, at Stelco, to Fasco, which is a non-union shop, sees pretty much the same package come into, into effect in their plant, supposedly voluntar voluntarily by the employer. So you're absolutely right. It does b stop competition. And we do want to stop competition amongst labor. Frankly, the labor movement has no, no, no bones well, about you, saying that. What, you because what, you, what, what happens with competition, let me finish my point. What happens with competition is that especially with a high unemployment rate, which is what we have. Um, well, that's what you want. No, if you have so. no, if you no, no, no. You that's competition in labor. You're going to get high unemployment. No, I want com what you want. I want competition for labor, and the best way to get, I want the the um, rather than having employees competing against each other, which ends up being a race for the bottom. This is what we saw in in, in the Dickensian world. A race for the bottom. A race for the bottom. I will work cheaper. Really than, to get to the bottom. I will I will work I will work cheaper than Rick because I have to work. You will work cheaper than than I will because you have to work and it ends up being a race for the bottom. What, it, what unions have done in this country, and what is so uh, damaging about the anti-union, um, the attack on unions and the attack on working people in this country, is that it forces down the level of wages and forces down the level of benefits and makes that many more people desperate for, for, for work under a free enterprise competitive system that you have. Okay, you've, 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 let's go back to one statement. Just, uh, were you, are unions good? Absolutely they were the ones that got you where you were today. But the problem is that the union continually seeks more and more and more. And to say that you're priced yourselves out of the market, you have. Look at the imports. Uh, you were talking earlier about this young fellow that goes over to follows Krejcian around, and he's talking about child labor. We're importing those materials. Now, you can't say stop buying those materials because it's child labor. It's people saying, I, I why, should I, why should I buy a Canadian shirt? For forty-five bucks, when it can be imported for uh, twenty-six dollars, because, so because, because of the so ethical question. No, no, no. Of course, it's the ethical question, but because there's the demand of various unions for more and more and more, up go the prices to satisfy the demands. And who does the price fall back on? We, the people. And therefore, okay. now we have to pay more. And then you say to that person, "How do you compete?" Do I spend just because I'm a Canadian? Do I buy the Canadian product? Or must I, through necessity, buy a product that is cheaper and offshore? Yeah, so it, lower the prices and we can make it so competitively and hire more people. I'll, I'll tell you what, if you want, what you're talking about is raising the domestic economy. If you want to raise the domestic economy, I mean, our export, our export economy has done very well in, in the last few years. Our business machine is subsidized, subsidized by provincial government and federal government, which is my dollar. Take that money away from those guys. Let them compete evenly. You know, go back to your because scab labor bit for a moment. And this is what we're really talking about. Okay, let's talk I about agree. I agree with that fact. You know what a scab is? A scab. A, a, a wound doesn't heal without a scab. So I never have understood why labor has used that term scab. You need a scab to heal a wound. What we have to do now is stop confrontational politics. In other words, stop this labor against government, government against labor, labor against we business, have, business against we government. We have no problem with, 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 with a tripartite approach to solving our economic problems. The, the labor movement again and again and again in the history of this country and this province has sat down at the table. I mean, we're no strangers to bargaining. That's what we do. We bargain. And to suggest that, that unions go to the bargaining table every time and get exactly the contract they want is ridiculous. But what about the 5,000 people that, that stormed Queen's Park? And we sit back as, as people who are trying to obey the laws and work within reason, looking at that and saying, does that represent the labor movement? I don't think it did, quite frankly. I think what you had was the militant 5,000. Behind that are the reasonable men and women who want a better life, work for their mm -hmm. union, try and do a good job, mm -hmm. but you've got that face out there that's put out by the militants. I, and, I, and I, would suggest, I would suggest to you that that face is probably put out more by the media than it is by the union. Well, no, all and, you do is look at them. Yeah, just all you well, do actually, is look at actually, them. Besides, be, well, okay, let's talk about that. Okay, let's talk about the face of labor. In that group at Queen's Park where, where there were unpleasant scenes, mm -hmm. um, you had uh, faith organizations, including uh, people from the United Church of Canada um, and from the Catholic churches. Uh, the Catholics for Peace and Development were involved in that demonstration. You had unions. Almost well, every. What you're telling every us is that all these groups are lobby groups, which we've been saying all along. 
that they are that they have crossed the boundary of being what they are. Unions don't represent they, their people anymore. They They're represent. Group. They represent. We. <laughs> they represent. <laughs> I talk to union people look, all the time. You know, union union members themselves are intimidated by their own unions. In the London oh, strike please. in December 11th, eight out of ten people, and they were quoted in the free press. They had all the quotes there. People were intimidated, scared of their own unions. What kind of representation you, can you possibly well, claim to have? There were twenty. There were I mean, twenty. There were twenty people from the Lindsay area. At, at that demonstration in, on December the 11th, on, and, and I can give you their names if you want. And if anybody was going to intimidate those people into taking part in that demonstration, it would be Rick no. and me. There were volunteers that here, but happen. in London, London itself, where the strike came down, you go back to Hamilton. I live in Burlington. So Hamilton is close enough that I can say I like Hamilton and it's a good city. But you watch now, a lot of people will be intimidated to show up because they say, that guy didn't come out, that gal didn't come out, that person didn't come out. The teachers' unions, one of the most militant unions, can say, that teacher didn't come out. So, come on, yeah, that's the so way it is. They don't even call themselves a union. Okay, but that's, <laughs> that is let's, the fact let's, of let's life. Get back, let's get back to, the, the, to, to one of the points we were discussing earlier, and, and, and I'm, I don't want to jump on Rick here, but if, if you look at the history of the labor movement in this country, okay? Yes, the labor movement, and, and you say, well, they're interest, all those are interest groups. Those interest groups have nowhere near the influence on the present provincial government and nowhere near on the passage of Bill, uh, Bill 7 that um, interest groups such as transnational corporations and the wealthy have, who represent a much, much, much smaller po portion of the population than unions do. Well, then we that, have, that's a contradiction in terms. How did the Harris government get elected? It has to get elected. Oh, sir, they were elected. Majority. They were elected on on a Are welfare. Rich people. They were no. They were elected on a welfare cut and and um, thirty percent tax cut. And a thirty percent tax well, cut. Well, then then you were incorrect. And you're but saying that the majority of Ontarians are tired of paying two taxes. The thirty percent tax cut's a lie. We're getting off the top. There are no answers to to some of these. You mentioned in your opening remarks there, David, that the those seven. Eliminated the possibility of uh, farmers uh, unionizing, unionizing the farm community. Mm -hmm. that correct? It did, it did uh, actually did it did worse farm, than that. Pardon? It did worse than that. I, I'm not familiar with that. But anyway, apparently that's one of the problems with this mm -hmm. Bill 7. Uh, we live in a farm community. Did the farmers here want to, to be unionized? No, I, I sorry. Yeah, we're not talking to the little farmers here. We're talking to the big farmers. We're talking like the grape growers, and that was 100, 150 people working. Not just a little farm with one or two people on it, because those need well, to go on. As a matter of fact, the, the, the provisions under Bill 40, um, there was a, a small mushroom plant mm -hmm. in Leamington, I believe. Is that the yes, correct that's location? Yes, that's it. Le Leamington, Ontario, that had organized, had bargained its contract, and was bargaining in good faith, and had a, had a good faith relationship with their employers, and automatically were decertified under Bill 7, even after they had already gone through the democratic process and decided to organize. So that's, uh, I mean, that's... That kind of shows you the the um, the way the propaganda was 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 foisted upon the people of Ontario. No, the union movement does not want to um, particularly organize every family farm across Ontario. But we we are moving well, what, away from yeah, it. That's why, the mess. Sorry, why do you ahead. choose Why do you choose the large ones? Why choose one with 150? Because people? Why because large corporations number? tend tend to take more advantages of their workers than than the yeah, average. But look, the farm. The, I don't the, think the you the can substantiate that. I mean. The fact that they've got 150 people working for them means that those people are finding something of value there. They're giving they're finding something a wage. exchange. Yeah, sure. They're making. They're, they've got a relationship, and that's what I think we're fundamentally missing the bottom line here. A job is a relationship. You don't have a right to it. Just I like agree. you don't have a right to be married to a particular woman or man. Mm -hmm. It's got to be a two-way street. Mm -hmm. And when one one side of the equation isn't happy anymore, then you part ways. That's just when, the way when, it is when, in the real world. And in and and in the real world. When one, if, if one person in a relationship has a, a great deal of power in that relationship and uh, may have the opportunity to abuse that power, then the other person in the relationship either leaves the relationship, which in, in an economic sense is, is often not viable, or that person finds ways of making themselves more powerful. And the way they find themselves more powerful is by uh, uh, negotiating. Uh, well, you know, as, as whose farm know. is it? Whose farm is it? If if a farm is passed down, a century farm, and it's successful with uh, oh, we're not with a century, about century no, farm. no, 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 no. Yes, you a... are. Yes, you are. Because the message gets out to the public. <coughs> Remember, think about what the public is perceiving here. They're perceiving unionized farms. 
That's what I'm perceiving. Mm -hmm. my, my relatives who own a section of land and mm -hmm. farm it, mm -hmm. they're susceptible to union when it comes time to harvest because mm -hmm. people are going to come in there. So as far as I'm concerned, the greatest um, free enterprise structure that we have in, in the province of Ontario today is the farmer because he's totally independent. He's a businessman, he's a farmer, mm -hmm. he's, he's a banker, he's everything mm -hmm. by himself. All of a sudden the union comes along and says, hold it, we're going to unionize you. And I'm saying, no way should a farm when be farm workers first be unionized. Question, first question, does a union, when, when uh, I work at Libby Owens Ford here in town, right? And I was, I was probably one of, one of the five or six people that were very instrumental in organizing that plant. Nobody at any time ever came to me and said, you are going to be unionized. I went to the CAW, I'm very proud of the fact I went to the CAW, and said, we have definite health and safety concerns. And here's a classic example of what you're talking about. Right? When that plant first opened up, we had serious health and safety concerns, very serious health and safety concerns that were not being addressed by the company. The only tool that allowed us to take those health and safety concerns in hand, even above the labor legislation well, and above the health and safety, safety concern might you be talking about? I'm talking about uh, exposure. I'm talking about exposure to isocyanates in in the production of urethane, which ca have have been known to cause mutagenic effects and 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 uh, and uh, miscarriages. Well, see, then it's a proper function of law to make sure that the employer is held responsible mm -hmm. for anything in that and, nature. And if that if that and if that's a failure of government, maybe a union is one way to approach it. But that doesn't justify the labor movement or striking against uh, specific target cities. I mean, what what is the what is the logic behind that? It's like advertising your, you know, union incompetence on think, a massive um, scale. Big thing. The best organizer we have are the companies themselves. If they don't treat their employees with dignity and respect and give them an honest and fair wage, that is when the union comes in. Well, what's a fair wage? You have minimum wage by law. Yeah. Can you live okay. on minimum wage? Hey, hold it. I Just a minute. <laughs> Just a minute. There's a lot of people. You don't you know buy that suit unless the minimum wage. But you know what our biggest problem is? is? We have grown through generations at the public nipple. Quite frankly, that's the way I put it. We've got a whole generation who has said, let the government do it. We've had generations of politicians of all stripes mm -hmm. have said, elect me and I'll give you. Elect me and I'll give you. And the union has said, if you don't do as we say, we will strike. And then the plant says, we will give you. So we've, lo we've grown up with, a, with three to four generations of politicians and people who cannot stand on their own two feet. If you've got a VCR, you want one. Whether you can afford one or not, put it on plastic. Now, after 40 years, the crunch is here. The crunch is here that, that says, no more can we live off the public. We now have to I become responsible for ourselves. And what you just said is a massive insult to every unionized employee. Right. Because what right. you're saying is, if I'm, if I'm a member of a union, then I'm not willing to stand on my own two feet. Indeed, I work and 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 every I I I didn't say I didn't say, say I'm saying, what saying, what all saying all citizens of this province have come to the realization that they've mortgaged their children's future now whether it's conservative government or liberal government or NDP itself your NDP went back to the right and became centrist sure. I reality set in they can't spend any more, and they can't tax any more. And, and the unions, Bob Ray, your own leader at the government level, come out and said the day he stepped down that the unions are out of touch with reality. That's Bob Ray, not mm -hmm. Don Pinnell, because he said they have, are going to have to learn that they cannot demand from those that cannot pay. Here, here's a, here's yeah, a question. If I, if here's I could, Dave, sure. please let me interject here. We're short of time. Half hour goes off with class. We have fun, you know. <laughs> um, we haven't talked really uh, about uh, what we do to improve conditions. We're <clears throat> talking about all the problems here, but we haven't talked about what we should do to improve conditions. First of all, if we're going to compete on a worldwide scale, we have to improve productivity, mm -hmm. not just increase mm -hmm. wages or diminish wages. We've got to improve productivity. And um, we haven't talked about the major problem of unemployment. Uh, uh, what would you think of uh, around the table uh, of, uh, uh, of a shorter work week, a four-day work week, share the workload? I think, I think that, that um, the, the problem with a four-day work week, and, and nobody, in, 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 especially in the leadership of the labor movement, is going to tell you that, that uh, a shorter work week is a bad idea. The problem is, is that, um, again, workers in this country are being asked to sacrifice for the excesses of, of, of other people. 
And this, so are you this comes back. Shorter work week? I'm for a shorter work week as long as there isn't a, a, a reduction in pay. I believe that the advances made in technology, which have increased, you talked about increased productivity. We have we have uh, processes now that have increased productivity. If you bring a machine into a plant and it increases productivity 100 percent, and you lay off two workers. The wealth that is being created by that machine is no longer going to those two workers in the form, or part of it, in the form of wages. Mm -hmm. So we have to find some way of redistributing that that wealth that we get through increased productivity mm -hmm. throughout throughout the, the uh, wage and, mm -hmm. and economic classes. Would you would you lobby? Would you consider that we should strive for a shorter work week? It means shorter pay. Oh. It means the employer is going to pay more. He has to have more. You got to hire more people in some um, train. The saying that come out of the last CLC convention was thirty for forty was the idea, but we got to also, if we're going less, the corporations have to take less. So okay. we just want to balance, if it was balanced and fair, it'd be okay. But if we take less, they're going to make more. So we just no, want to be fair. They would have to pay more. They're, they're going to have to pay additional benefits for more. They're going to have to hire more employees. They'd have to hire, uh, pay more in benefits. They'd have to train more people. It would cost more. The, but they, the they production is there nowadays. Pardon? Like you said, the production with automation uh, and everything else. Okay. We you're have you're a subway saying, system. A subway <laughs> system down the states runs all by itself. But they have one person on there mm -hmm. just to make the people feel mm -hmm. secure and safe, mm -hmm. as if somebody is running this. That's that's progress. Yeah. Anyway. Well, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> all right. So you're saying what? Yay or nay? So um, you are, would you argue for favor for shorter work week? Thirty and for forty. It's thirty right. hours. For 40, 40 hours, hours pay. pay. Impossible, I well, think. I mean, <laughs> I mean, while we're at it, why don't we just make it a zero hour work week and keep the same pay? Yes, yeah. that's principle. ridiculous. That's ridiculous. <laughs> well, you think that's ridiculous, but four days is just as ridiculous. I mean, it's just as arbitrary. Mm -hmm. um, all you're saying is you want a three day weekend every week. Mm -hmm. uh, pro you know, here you are saying that your, your jobs depend on productivity and all the automation and the machinery that's at your disposal, and you're darn right. That's what your jobs depend on, not on unions and not on the labor movement. Those things are in your way. And I think the sooner that more people in the labor movement understand that, the sooner they'll be looking in the right direction and not trying to beat their heads against it. So you want everybody making minimum wage and the corporations making all that. the profits? Everybody's got their own minimum they're, wage. They're all saying everybody, that. Everybody, so everybody, if what, in, in, in unions at minimum wage. In a world, wage. What, what, what do you but think? No, you're, you're why, suggesting why are you guys in the union talking about minimum wage? You guys you aren't brought it up. the same you brought, no. you brought up the minimum wage, and what happens is the minimum wage ends up being the minimum wage because you the have minimum wage. You have yeah, minimum wage becomes maximum wage because you have massive without so any you kind of organization. Minimum wage? You're, you're being paid minimum wage right now? Can I finish my point? May I finish my point? Mm -hmm. if, if you have the minimum wage, if you suggest that wage is the way to go, you know, everybody has a different minimum that. wage. You what, you have, what you have is I don't believe in a minimum cut, wage. Throat, cut throat Okay, so less than the minimum wage. Right. Like cutthroat competition. Cutthroat yeah. competition. Self-employed people all work at less than minimum wage. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, Thank I, you very much for I letting me make my point. point. Don has done. I would just, I would just wind up my particular point. I disagree with Jim. I, I think uh, there should not be a 30-hour work week, for, for 30 for 40. I think it should be the 40-hour work week. Um, if you're going to have a 30-hour work week, that's fine. If a company can negotiate that, but you're paid for 30 hours. Yeah. You're paid for what you work for, not the handouts. Mm -hmm. that I'm, I am just so fed up with, with the hands out asking for this. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, going back to the fact of the scab labor, great. Replace it. Let's stop holding companies responsible for everything. Hold on. Okay. Let's stop holding companies responsible for everything and hold people responsible for everything. I think that a government going in should have a year-round uh, round table made up of business, labor, and government always talking about the issues as they crop up today, deal with them today. But Not we weren't even invited to the, the table. We weren't even no, invited to the wrong. table here. That's wrong. That's wrong. Union and business from the, from the Imperial yeah, Bank of Commerce should be put there. Okay? Unionized well, workers are the regular oh, working on, person. But, but the whole yeah, point that I'm what, what, do you think yeah. the, what do you think the average, what do you think the average wage regular, is in, in, in the CAW right now? Do what you, do you think the average wage is in the CAW? What is your impression uh, of the average I wage? I have no idea, but I know it's above, above minimum wage. Yes, it is above minimum and wage. Thank I, you. And I also know that anybody who works in a competitive field is called a scab or yes. wants to work less. Yes. So, and at the same time, you're telling me you represent these scabs. I, the I, your movement represents scabs, no, does it? Because, no, it does not represent. Minute. I will tell. I tell you what. What the union movement does do, and I will tell you this quite plainly and quite, as, as frankly as I can. The union movement spends a great deal of time and energy not only representing the the, the narrow and, and and specific interests of its membership, 
but the union movement also has been going out and trying to do away with child labor in the third world. Maybe you can go out and buy a shirt from, from, from Taiwan that's made by a, a, an eight-year-old why, why would the union be wasting but, its time talking about child labor in the third world where they need child labor? Because other than that, it's child oh, death. Please, no. Wait, I mean, that's what, the alternative. No, what happens? We're getting to another issue. Well, well, you, yeah, we are. Part. We, that's, what I'm, that's why I'm asking. That, when is, when is labor <laughs> going to start their finish? own employment agency? Let me if you want to talk about labor, hiring people, why doesn't the labor movement, with their millions and millions of dollars, start their own employment agency to help out their own members instead of crashing City Hall and all the rest of these places and demonstration. Teachers taking time off from school, which we taxpayers are paying. So when are you guys in labor going to take responsibility for part of the unemployment? We have, have Stelco Steel. Labor bought Stelco Steel. Oh, uh, no. Uh, oh, Goma Steel. Uh, Goma, Goma Steel. Steel. Okay, Goma Steel. That's, what's wrong with that? That's I great. That's great. Yeah, I think it's great. Right. I support too. it. Yes. 100%. But we never get, we never get in, unionized labor, organized labor never gets any kudos for those kind of things. We're always the ones that are, that are, that are but what we have done, and we have a track record, and we can show you the track record of fighting not only for organized workers, but also for the interests of unorganized workers. Every time uh, the unemployed. Well, uh, that's what I asked. Well, the, the second give me an injured. example. How are you fighting for scabs, for example? I don't. I don't. Uh, scabs. Are, scabs are. Your. Your. Uh, scabs are good. Remember? You're, no, you I, agree, good. I agree. They're, they're good. good. They're good. They're good. No, I agree no, they're a labor. Scab, a scab. A scab is someone who would go and steal your job. And no, that's they're not stealing they're not your job. Stealing. You and walked yeah. away from the, away from the labor has walked away from the job. What about the situation? I've been locked in. The coldest uh, month, uh, the uh, month, the driest uh, month. Well, month well, 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 once again, we're driving down a road here that we can't find an end to this one. What we need to do is create a better atmosphere between management, labor, government, and so on. Uh, we don't seem to have come to, to complete agreement, certainly, on the, on the shorter work week, but let's try uh, profit sharing. Wouldn't it be a good idea for both labor and management to get into profit sharing? That is, make it mandatory for an employee to own a piece of the company. So he's not just working for himself. He's not working for more money. He hasn't got a union battling uh, for the guy that isn't doing his job well, trying to protect the interests of oh, everybody. Man, every uh, <laughs> get everybody working for the bottom line in the company. Would you, would you agree with Oh, I was just going to say the profit sharing would be OK as long as the, em the employees had a say on what goes on in this committee. Uh, what's going if on? If they're shareholders, they would have a say. That's yes, right. They I have agree. to have a share. I agree. They have to talk. The Algoma, the Algoma cool. steel, steel uh, situation is a perfect example of that. It worked I mean, well. Where, yeah, and that, that worked very well, and it saved, saved a lot of jobs. Right, look at Ontario Hydro. Okay. They, had, uh, they, right, they wrongfully got rid of the labor voice that was there, mm -hmm. and, you know, they went to court, etc. Okay, I'm not commenting on that, but up to that point, labor had a spot on the largest board yeah. in the province of Ontario, which I think is good. I, I don't mm -hmm. have a problem with... with uh, a labor sitting on, uh, and on, this is, on the board. And this, is why, and this is why you have seen the demonstration at Queen's Park and London shut down and all those things, and you're going to see, see more of it. And it'll be wrong. Labor is going to suffer you can say because wrong, of that. But the reason, the yeah. reason, the reason you, you, we can talk about the strategy all we want, but we've decided on that strategy. Oh, I know that. The, the reason that that um, outrage has been spent that way is because unlike in the 60s, unlike in the 70s, Labor, at this point, with government and business, doesn't even get a seat at the table. When we talk about Bill 40 and Bill 7, when Bill 7 came in, Bill 7 was introduced, and uh, Bob White, who's the democratically elected uh, uh, leader of the CLC, Ford Wilson, the point never got to the table. Bill 7 so, was supported by all those scabs and all the unemployed people that you keep referring to. It wasn't supported necessarily by big business. Sure, they support it because they get benefit the, from it. But it's this little guy who supported Bill 7, who wanted a chance at getting a job, and who's kept out the of the job. The same people that support Bill 26. Same yeah. people who supported the Conservatives, mm -hmm. because they went, they went to the public and said, here's our revolution, here's and where 40, we stand. And 44% okay. of 60% okay. of the population But that doesn't matter. That's <laughs> our democratic <laughs> system. Right. Just, so just it's fine. quickly around the table, about 30 seconds apiece. What would you do to improve relations? I would, I, would, I would definitely, if I was in the government, I'd, I'd be asking Labor to come to the table. And also, I'd, I would try and, and, and mitigate the effects of the, of the economic problems, not on the backs of the poor and the working people of this province, but rather on, on, on people who can afford it and have benefited right. from it. The government has to come to the table, or the labor has to go, the government has to invite labor to the table to um, 
whoever these bills are changing that. Like, we all have our inputs. I want to get talking have, about this, I'm done, but anyway. All I'm just saying, the government has to invite us to the table and have our inputs on the changes instead of them just dictating what's going on. Okay, thank you. Bob? I don't think the government has any right to dictate any conditions on either side of the equation, whether it's for business or for labor. I think we've got to be in a competitive environment. I think unions should be uh, voluntary organizations where members can join one-on-one -on -one and decide whether they want to be represented by a union. That would solve everything right from the ground up. Great, thank you. Well, I, I think there's a place for union on, uh, at the table. I think we have to stop this confrontational form of government, and the only way you're going to get it is when you, equally, when you sit down at the table as equals for the betterment of our province and for the betterment of people. That's the only way we're going to solve. So long as we have confrontational politics and confrontational labor, you're always going to have problems. Here, here. I thank you very much, uh, David St. John, for being here. Rick Denier, Bob Metz, and Don Pinnell. Pleasure. Uh, Pleasure. Our next program, Sharon McRae, former Reeve of uh, Ops Township and Warden of Victoria County, and Chris Hodgson, our Member of Parliament and uh, Provincial Parliament and Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development and Mines, will discuss or debate the recent Tory budget cuts. Are they too severe? Are they hitting on women and children excessively, the disadvantaged people? What better way should they be uh, cutting costs? Thank you for tuning in, and good night.